Okay. Did I guess? It is. Other people may be coming on, but it is after 10, so we will go ahead. I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order and uh, start with the minutes of the last meeting, Jill. Okay. President Jack Baker called the Going State District Heritage Association meeting to order at 10.03 a.m. with 23 members and guests present virtually. 42 people have watched the YouTube video. Secretary Jim Terry read the minutes of the March meeting and they were approved as given. Treasurer Ruth Faulkner's financial report was read by Jim Terry. As of April 16, 2022, Total monies are $15,726.64. The report was approved as read. Maribel Chase gave her Cherokee Moment presentation, reading letters from the Office of Indian Affairs Special Files, 1807 to 1904, that she had transcribed from microfilm at the National Archives. The special files are additional files for letters received by the Office of Indian Affairs. This large collection can also be found online at familysearch.org. Curtis Rohr reminded us of the Oklahoma Trail of Tears Association spring meeting at the Shota Center in Tahlequah on April 23rd. Jack Baker's presentation was the Going Snake Tragedy, April 15th, 1872, that happened 150 years ago. This included accounts, maps, photos, and illustration of people involved in the events before and after April 15th, and how the jurisdiction and sovereignty issues faced then are still with us today. Jack Baker adjourned the meeting at 11.42 a.m. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Are there any additions or corrections? If not, I would entertain a motion that they be approved as given. I, so I make a motion. Okay, I'll say it. Curtis made the motion and Becky seconded. Okay, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. <clears throat> Jim, do we have the treasurer's report? I did not receive one. Okay. Then, X? Oh, I will, will comment that I didn't. Ask Lindsay Robertson, who's head of the Indian Law at the University of Oklahoma Law School, to uh, present on the McGurk case today to tie in with what we talked about the last meeting. But it seems his daughter is graduating from the University of Virginia Law School today. <laughs> so he wasn't really available, but he ha has agreed to speak next month on that. So, okay. Next is our Cherokee Moments by Mary Bell. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my Cherokee Moments for this morning is a uh, correspondence that Jerry Clark had given me many years ago. In fact, I think it was probably the first time I ever went to the National Archives. Uh, that he gave me this uh, letter that he had transcribed. And uh, he may, probably many of you uh, have this letter from him because Jerry was very generous in uh, giving uh, documents to, to people uh, to uh, assist them. And here is his transcription. Colonial Office Records Number 5, oh, in parentheses, records excuse me let me start over colonial office records and in parentheses number five volume 80 into parentheses in public records office london united kingdom transcribed from microfilm copy in the library of congress Washington, D.C. by Jerry L. Clark, September the 10th, 1990 was when he transcribed it. Letter dated April the 9th, 1779. 
Usanala Town, Robert Dews to Alexander Cameron. This will be handed you by the bearer of Mr. Scott's letters, which was to have been dispatched the day after they were dated. Anthony Foreman, who was to have carried them, was prevented by sickness. I then applied to an Indian who promised to set out in four days after Mr. Scott left this place. He came at the time appointed and, sa and said that he missed his horse. It was with some difficulty that the Kawi warrior engaged the bearer. Mr. Scott set off on his expedition the 30th, 30th, the 30th, accompanied by the good warrior and 10 men from, and I may not pronounce these place names correctly, but just bear with me, from Kuala, Kuala Key, where the Ustanala, excuse me, where the Isamala, question mark, Jerry made a question mark because he wasn't sure about that, Indians live. The Raven and Katagiski with 15 men from Salaquo, white men, Graves, Proctor, Rowe, Springston, Riley, Siri, and Vernon of your company, John Ramsey, John Christie, and Samuel Benjamin from the Re Rebel towns, and Charles Hughes and Joseph Van, and Joseph Van, since passes this force to join him, six of the Kohada Indians, and followed by John Brown, the bear and Charles Beamer, and the day following, the young turkey and terrapin, in parentheses, the great warrior's son, in parentheses, with 25 men. James Hughes and this day, 24 of the Tukwa people and 21 of the Kosakahachi, and a question mark after that, people accompanied by Hicks, Maros and Luke set off from Kusa Chatihi, question mark, period. The little bird and a large party with him likewise set off this day from the town to join the former parties and a considerable number from the disaffected towns is, is, in expect, is expected to join the last parties. Paragraph, Mr. McDonald passed this river at Kusawahatihi, question mark, yesterday with a number of his division. The bloody fellow, or Nina Tuya, parted from them three days since with an order for ammunition. He took about 20 Indians and four white men, is with Mr. McDonald, colon. John Van, Campbell, Levitt, and Bench. This party was to have joined Mr. Scott at this place, but a report was transmitted that a number of rebels were on their way from Long Island in boats to route the towns on the Tennessee River. However, the party setting out at the island is, a t is intended as a reinforcement of the Illinois so that Mr. McDonnell have left Judd's friend with about 75 men to prevent their passing and takes as many prisoners as possible if the rebels should not be superior in force. Paragraph, I am proud to inform you that the whole nation seems unanimous against the rebels. Every town and village in the woods have sent and are daily sending men against them. The disaffected in the valleys, middle, and lower towns are daily falling off 
from them and surely believe that with a little encouragement at this time from you would be in the course of this summer bring the them entirely out of the old towns paragraph the raven and old tossel have been with mr mcdonnell i have not heard the particulars of their business but the great warrior has left his medal with his son the terrapin who intends seeing you after his return from the war paragraph by two fellows from the Estenoda settlement, and he has a question mark there, now in the house, has informed of a large party consisting of Hawassi and Chesty people on their way to join Messrs. McDonnell and Scott at the rendezvous at the standing, standing peach tree, so that a moderate computation shows those gentlemen will have 300 men exclusive of what may join them from the disaffected towns. This much, sir, I have taken the liberty of acquainting you with, as I thought it a part of my duty, being subsequent to Mr. Scott's departure. Paragraph, I must beg your patience a little to acquaint you that the number of traders on this river is too great for the number of hunters, they not being sufficient to support five of us. John Morris at Cusa Tahiti and John Yornuck at Salico, John Seek and James Ramsey and myself at this place. As I am the latest, I hope you will grant me a permit for some other town of, of them on the Tennessee. I would prefer Tuskegee as many of the old customers reside in and about that town. My reason for applying to you at this time is that I say not be too late as the fall of the year with time enough for me to move to that place should it be for your pleasure your obedient servant robert dues and that's d-e-w-s and i want to read the next page which is a half a page of jerry's comments about this letter and jerry says comments concerning this document the letter writer the trader robert dues d-e-w-s two years previously, had filed for safety in the American settlements and was probably Robert D.U.E., who was the grandfather of Deanna Rogers, the Cherokee wife of Samuel Houston, and that's in parentheses. Alexander Cameron was called Scotchy by the Cherokees and had resided with the tribe since 1768 and he had at least three mixed blood children many of the other persons mentioned in this letter can be identified with the indian countrymen progenitors of mixed blood cherokee families four men were probably my ancestors meaning jerry's ancestors anthony foreman john mcdonnell walter scott and Nathan Hicks, two separate individuals, John Van and Joseph Van were named with a former, and that would be John Van, specifically listed as a white man with each man joining separate war parties. Joseph Van may have been the brother-in-law of Charles Hughes, and both are mentioned together. There was also a James Hughes mentioned, and separate paragraph. Other white men included Greaves or Graves, Rowe, William Springston, Richard Riley, Proctor, John Christie, Charles Beamer, John Brown, Campbell, Levitt or, Lev or Levitt, Levitt, and Bench, 
or Benj, as he's got it with question mark, whose surnames can be traced in Dr. Emmett Starr's old Cherokee families. Other individuals have yet to be identified. Vernon, Siri, John Ramsey, James Ramsey, Mor Morose, Luke, Samuel Benjamin, John Morris, John Yurnuck, and John Seek. There are a number of Cherokee chiefs and warriors listed in Dew's letter, including the great warrior of Choda or Oconestoda and his son, the Terrapin. His nephew, the Raven of Choda, and his brother, Kid Augusta, called Katagiski in the letter. Other warriors and chiefs were the Bloody Fellow, the Bear, the Cowie Warrior, the Young Turkey, Little Bird, and Judd's friend, also known as Ostinaco. And those are Jerry's notes. And incidentally, my ancestors are, I'm descendant from Oconestota through his son, the Terrapin. And most of the Van families are a descendants of uh, Oconestota. And that's my Cherokee moments for this morning. Thanks, Mary Bell. We appreciate that very much. It's an interesting document, and it does have many of our ancestors listed. Yes, it does. And uh, incidentally, that citation, anyone might, who might want to delve in uh, uh, at the Library of Congress, delve into that particular set of records for other documents. There may be others, and maybe scores of them, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, there are. Any other comments on our tricky moments? We appreciate that, Mary Beth. What year, what year was that document? Uh, the letter was written 1779. Thank you. Uh -huh. And it was Robert Deuce was writing the letter to Alexander Cameron, who was the British Cherokee agent. To the Cherokees. Thank you. Right in the middle of the Revolutionary War. Yes. <laughs> but all the ones mentioned there were on the side of the British. Yes. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, we lost one of our longtime Boing Snake members since the last meeting, Meg Hamilton. And David and I attended her service in Tahlequah, and there was a very large crowd there. The funeral started at 2 o'clock, and I got there at 1.30, and the, they were parking cars in the fields there already. It was so full. Wow. So it was a good turnout. And Rita, you and Andy had a good trip, I understand. Oh, you're on you're on mute, Rita. We did. We had a wonderful trip, and those ladies out there were so gracious and kind to take us around and show us so many different sites that we wouldn't normally have seen on the tourist trail. Uh, they they were wonderful. And the highlight of my trip was getting to go to uh, Caleb Starr's uh, home place where his house had been. And uh, the people that had bought the place originally from Starr had, uh, it's been in their family. And they didn't buy all of it, of course, but um, where his homestead is, they own that land. And um, so they had kept the steps that went into the cabin. And I got to actually go and see those steps and stand on them and everything. It was wonderful. So, but we got to see so, so many things. It was like an incredible trip. Good. And I know David has been there to the star. Mm -hmm. Becky, have you been there? 
No, I have not. <laughs> I haven't, I, but I want to go. I, I know about where it is, and of course, I've been on the highways and looked over towards Star Mountain and, and it's seen the approximate location, but I haven't actually been there and seen those steps. So maybe I'll do that one of these days when I'm back there, hopefully. Good. And Curtis, do you or David want to report on the Oklahoma Chapter Trilliteers meeting? Uh, don't David do that. He uh, pretty well managed all that. Well, we had a pretty successful meeting. I think we had about 25 people show up. And we were also, Andy Squires got us hooked up on Zoom. I don't think the Zoom worked perfectly, but it was our first time. So maybe we'll do better next time. It worked pretty good. Uh, the only time I had trouble hearing was when the, the bike riders were introducing themselves. It, but once um, uh, Rita started speaking, uh, I could hear everything really well. David, you want to comment on Anita's talk? Oh, Anita, I'm sorry. <laughs> she, gave a, she gave a great talk about the genesis of the Eastern Band. And I had heard a talk similar to that before, but she had embellished it a lot more this time from what I had heard a few years ago. So I thought it was well worth it. She came here on uh, Monday and left the following Monday with her friend Robin. So they spent an entire week here visiting the sites and I think they had a good time. I know Troy and I saw them the next week in uh, Cherokee for our spring board meeting for the Trail of Tears Association, which the entire meeting turned out quite well. We had a field trip to Judicola Rock and by the and we went by the old town of Tuckasegee where the Downing had his trading post in the mid 1700s and Rhett Riggs gave a great talk on Fort Armistead which is uh, <laughs> established in East Tennessee near the North Carolina border and on the Unicoid Turnpike to keep to help with the there's a gold strike at Coker Creek there and so it was established initially to uh, manage or keep out the intruders from the gold strike. But then it was later used as a stopping point uh, on the uh, trailer tiers and, and all the Cherokees removed from North Carolina, including several hundred creeks that had taken refuge there during the creek removal, were all removed through Fort Armistead. And it's a site that has pristine trail segments through there and as well as two large springs that they used. And the fort site is a great archeological site because the ground had never ever been plowed, which was extremely rare. So, and then the next week there was a hearing on it to have it designated a National Historic Landmark. And the committee approved that and passed it on to the board at the National Park Service who will review that and decide if it gets National Historic Landmark status, which is pretty high up. For many years, we did not have a National Historic Landmark site in Oklahoma. And finally, our Cherokee Capitol building was designated. Now we have several, but mm -hmm. The Cherokee Capitol building was the first one in the state of Oklahoma. So, so hopefully that will pass and will be uh, probably what will be the first and maybe the only site that we get as a National Historic Landmark that's on the Trail of Tears. Anything to add, Troy? Um, 
Andy sent um, a recording of Anita's presentation and we'll work on it just a little bit. It doesn't need much and it'll be available from the uh, Trail of Tears website, uh, as will the presentation that Dr. Riggs did for the spring uh, board meeting when we were in Cherokee. Uh, that's about an hour and a half uh, presentation and it's very good and requires a little work. So we'll soon have both of those available from from the website. And both of them were very, they were just really good presentations, well laid out, good. Well, do we have any other old business or any items to discuss? Oh, oh there is one thing. I did get a call from Donna Clark this week, and I had told her that we do plan to be at Concord for our July uh, meeting, which will be a potluck luncheon. So, unless there are objections to it. <laughs> there may be from some of those out of town, but, uh, but we will meet in person at Concord in July. Biden. Jack, what's the date of that meeting? It's the, I'll see if I can pull up my calendar. <clears throat> it is uh, July 16th. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other business, old or new? Okay. Well, Mike Wren and I, a couple of months ago, uh, made we made a couple of trips in February, early February to early March to Tennessee State Library and Archives. <clears throat> and one of the main things we concentrated on were the Supreme Court cases that Mike had made a list of that related to the Cherokees. And I mentioned one of them a couple of months ago at our meeting, the Lewis Ross case, where a lot of details were given on providing provisions for the Trail of Tears. So it's a very, well, it's a hundred and some pages of transcriptions. And I have uh, <coughs> a dozen pages that I transcribe, and I'll try and uh, abbreviate some of it. But it was the court case of James Calhoun at all. Was, was James C. Calhoun, Lafayette, Flournoy, John F. Harris, were the complainants against Lewis Ross and his son, Robert Ross. And they were suing in East Tennessee because they had discovered, they couldn't sue in the Cherokee Nation, but they had discovered that he still had land. And he had, I forgot what it was, five or six tracts of land still there in East Tennessee, including his 640-acre reservation and 600 acres of the John Walker reservation that he had purchased with 40 acres of that being set aside for the town of Calhoun when it was established. So they sued in the court there. But one of the more interesting testimonies was that given by Thomas C. Heinemann, who had been hired by Lewis Ross to help provide the provisions along the trail. And the Thomas C. Hyman, by the way, is he, Thomas C. Hyman and Lewis Ross married sisters. So they were, technically, I guess, the brother-in-laws. Okay. Well, this is 
state of Mississippi, Tippa County, which is where Thomas Hyman lived, and be able to remember that on the first day of December, 1851, I, Passel M. Saunders, mayor of the town of Ripley, County of Tippa, and the ex officio justice of the peace in and for the said county. So by virtue of the power of me vested by the commission to examine all witnesses on behalf of Lafayette, Flournoy, John Harris, and James C. Calhoun complainants, as of Lewis Ross and Robert D. Ross respondents. So it's in the matter of the uh, court case in Athens in McMinn County, Tennessee. And then it says, came before me at my office, Thomas C. Heinemann, age about 58 years, as a witness on behalf of Lewis Ross and Robert Ross. And interrogatory first, are you acquainted with the parties in this suit or either of them? Answer, I have no acquaintance whatever with either the person mentioned above as the complainants, but I'm acquainted with Lewis Ross and Robert Ross. Interrogatory second, are you acquainted with a man by the name of George D. Gordon, who was employed by Lewis Ross, one of the respondents in the suit, to provide subsistence for the Cherokee Indians during their removal west in the year 1838? Answer, in the month of August 1838, at the Cherokee agency on the Wasee River, Bradley County, Tennessee, I became acquainted with the above name George D. Gordon and knew him to have been employed as an agent by said Lewis Ross. Interrogatory third, do you know the terms and conditions of the agreement and contract between Lewis Ross and George Gordon in regard to the agency of said George Gordon in procuring subsistence for the Cherokee Indians while removing from the agency in Tennessee to the Cherokee Nation West in 1838? If so, state them all particularly and minutely. Answer, I consider myself acquainted with the terms and stipulations of the agreement from the facts of having learned it from both parties, to wit, the said Lewis Ross and George D. Gordon about the time the said agreement was made. The said Lewis Ross having contracted with the authorities of the Cherokee Nation East to furnish subsistence for the said Cherokee Nation while removing from the agency in Tennessee to their country west of the Mississippi River in the year 1838. And for the purpose of carrying out said contract in good faith, he required a number of persons to be employed and to act in the capacity of agents in the procurement of subsistence for said Indians on their journey west. And among the number was the said George D. Gordon and this deponent. George D. Gordon aforesaid agreed with said Lewis Ross contractor as aforesaid to give all his personal attention and services and to render all the aid in his power in carrying out in good faith his said contract. And at all times while employed in said business to be subject and abide by such instructions as he might from time to time receive from said Ross touching on that on said business. And for the attention and services of said Gordon and the promises aforesaid, said Ross agreed to allow Gordon upon final settlement of his contract with the authorities of the Cherokee Nation, the full one seventh part of all his profits which might arise from said contract, either by land or water. It being then in contemplation to send one portion by land and the remainder by water. And in the event any loss should be sustained in carrying out said contract, said Gordon was to bear his proportionate part of one seventh. And he goes on to say that uh, the agreement was initially verbal, but then it was later signed. And then he saw the written contract because there was another case in uh, Washington, D.C that uh, he had testified on. And that's when he saw various documents. And it said, said written agreement was signed by the parties aforesaid in their own proper handwriting and witness, interestingly enough, by John C. McCain in his proper handwriting 
dated the 10th day of November, 1838. So we'll have to get David to work on this and see if this is Senator John McCain's ancestor. <clears throat> but it goes on and talks about the written contract and it said they adjourned till the next day and there was an interrogatory four. If George D. Gordon, before he set out in the performance of his duties under the agreement with Lewis Ross, received any special and particular directions from Lewis Ross as to the manner those duties were to be performed by George Gordon, state fully and minutely what those directions were. Answer. As stated in the opponent's answer in the last interrogatory, it had been contemplated to send a portion of said Cherokee immigrants by land and the remainder by water. And the first day of September, having been agreed upon by the authorities of the Cherokee Nation and Major General Winfield Scott on behalf of the United States, as the day on which said immigrants should commence their journey west, it became necessary that Lewis Ross, the contractor for subsisting said immigrants, should make preparations in advance so as to have a competency of subsistence at convenient places as said immigrants passed on. And 6,000 persons with 3,000 horses being the number first contemplated to be transported by land. Lewis Ross contractors aforesaid selected the said George Gordon to go in advance of said Cherokee immigrants for the purpose of making the arrangements. The directions given by said Lewis Ross to George Gordon were to proceed with as little delay as possible, taking time, however, to discharge the duties assigned to him on the route the Cherokee immigrants were to travel as far as their intended homes west of the Mississippi River and to procure upon the best possible terms such subsistence for said immigrants and their horses, as he, the said Ross, by his contract with the authorities of the Cherokee Nation, was bound to furnish, and to have a sufficiency of said supplies for 6,000 Indians and 3,000 horses, deposited convenient stages on said route from the Cherokee Agency East to the Cherokee Country West. And at the same time, say in the latter part of the month of August, 1838, the said Lewis Ross placed in the hands of Gordon the sum of $5,000 in US Treasury notes and directed him to expend said money in the purchase of sugar, coffee, and soap. One portion to have been deposited at the crossing of the Ohio River at Golconda, Illinois, and the other portion at Willard's formerly Green's Ferry, being the intended crossing place for said immigrants on the Mississippi River. So, interrogatory fifth. If you know, state whether or not the said George D. Gordon violated any of those instructions and directions in what, and in what way? Answer. In order to give a more explicit and satisfactory answer to this interrogatory, the deponent deems it proper to give his full account of the actings and doings of Gordon in regard to the manner he discharged the duties assigned to him by Lewis Ross, as came within his knowledge. The opponent states that are before the first day of September, 1838, the time fixed for the 6,000 immigrants to start by land, and for some weeks after, a severe drought prevailed. Consequently, the water courses were low and many were dried up. Therefore, the starting of the first 6,000 was postponed by orders of General Scott until the early part of October the same year. And in the meantime, the arrangement for sending the remaining immigrants, which amounted to about 7,000 by water, was abandoned, and the whole to go by land except a few who from sickness, old age, and other infirmities were considered unable to perform the journey by land. Those few were sent by water. And see, this was something that we didn't know was that they were only planning to send half of them by land and the other half by water. Of course, we were aware that initially they were going to send them all by water. So, 
in consequence of this change in the mode of immigrating the remaining 7,000, it became necessary for the contractor, Lewis Ross, to have additional arrangements made on the route to those he had directed and Gordon to make for the first 6,000. Therefore, with that view, Lewis Ross selected this deponent and charged him with that duty, also giving him similar instructions and directions to those personally given to Gordon with additional authority to take a general supervision of the whole business on the route connected with the said Lewis Ross's contract. The opponent set out in the Cherokee Agency East about the fourth day of November, 1838, the day on which the last detachment of immigrants started on the land route. The opponent had proceeded on his journey about 15 miles when he met the aforesaid Gordon on his return to the agency. This meeting surprised the opponent because he knew full well that if Gordon had faithfully complied with the directions given him by Ross to wit to proceed as far as the Cherokee country west, a distance of more than 850 miles, and make the necessary arrangements for the purchase of subsistence sufficient for 6,000 Indians and 3,000 horses, he could not by any reasonable possibility be as far back as where the opponent met him. Therefore, the opponent expressed his surprise at this meeting him. Gordon replied he had performed the duties assigned him, that he had traveled as far as the Cherokee country west of Mississippi, that he had made ample arrangements for the 6,000 immigrants and 3,000 horses for the entire route. And upon advantageous, excuse me, and upon advantageous terms for the contractor, Lewis Ross, and stated further that he had purchased the sugar, coffee, and soap to the amount of $5,000, and had deposited the same as directed at the crossings of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, that he had discharged all the duties assigned him by Ross, and having understood the entire immigration would be conducted by land, was then on his return to Ross at the agency for any additional instructions he might wish to give. And then they returned till the next day. The opponent, in continuation of his answer, states after hearing the subject of Gordon's return to the agency, informed him, said Gordon, that the duty of making necessary arrangements on the route for subsisting the remaining immigrants had been confided to him, deponent. And as Gordon had so recently traveled the same route and upon the same business, his knowledge of the resources of the country would aid deponent in the purchase of the supplies needed. Therefore, deponent would be glad to have the said Gordon associated with him in said duties. Gordon expressed an entire willingness to do so, provided it would meet the approbation of Ross and believing that Ross would interpose no objection, Gordon requested the opponent to delay one day at Blythe Ferry on the Tennessee River and at or before the expiration of the time, he would overtake the opponent and accompany him on his intended route. The opponent in accordance with said request did delay one day at the place designated, but Gordon came not. And the opponent being desirous to have him with him delayed another half day. And Gordon not coming, the opponent considered his duties of so much importance, he left without seeing or hearing anything more from Gordon and proceeded on the immigration route, making arrangements as he traveled for all detachments in his rear as he passed on. The opponent made frequent inquiries for contracts made by Gordon for supplies for the 6,000, but seen none until he arrived in McMinnville, Tennessee. At that place, a contract was presented to the opponent purporting to have been made by G.N. Jeffries as agent for Lewis Ross, contractor for 4,000 bushels of threshed oats at 75 cents per bushel, besides a large quantity of fodder and sheaf oats at equally high prices. The opponent seeing a contract purporting to have been made by G.N. Jeffries as agent for Ross was no little surprised because the opponent knew of his own knowledge that Ross had confided no such authority to Jeffries. Therefore, 
deponent directed all sub-agents then in his rear and in said town of McMinnville, who'd been employed to travel with each detachment of immigrants for the purpose of receiving supplies and turning them over to the Indian commissary to disregard said contract for the threshed oats, etc., made with one Turk coal bill. So the opponent at the same place purchased corn at 40 cents per bushel and other articles in proportion and could have purchased threshed oats at 30 cents per bushel, whereas the other contract called for it at 75 cents per bushel. Several detachments had passed McMinnville before the opponent arrived and had taken supplies from Mr. Colville on the said contract, doubtless under the belief that Jeffries was authorized by Ross to make the contract. Thereby, Ross sustained a heavy loss in the amount so taken. The opponent states further that the next contract for supplies, which he'd seen, was at Mr. Reddy's, about 45 miles east of Nashville. The opponent, having then gotten advance of all the detachments comprising it, the 7,000 and also one or two of the detachments belonged to the 6,000, it became necessary that he should be particular in inquiring for contracts made by Gordon so as not to make contracts to conflict with each other. And Mr. Reddy's, as above stated, when the opponent made inquiry for supplies, and also if any contract had been previously made there, Mr. William F. Reddy produced before the opponent a contract purporting to have been made with the said Jeffries as agent for Ross contractor. After hearing from the opponent that Jeffries had no authority from Ross to make contracts, tracks in his name. Mr. Reddy gave up the said contract to the opponent, and when the opponent gave his deposition in Washington City, <clears throat> did he prove the signature of Jeffries, signed agent of Ross, contractor subsisting immigration to be in the proper handwriting of Jeffries, and made such agreement a part of his deposition. And he also makes a copy of it available as exhibit B in his deposition here. The contract to Mr. Reddy, he claimed there was then a considerable amount of supplies mentioned in said contract, which had not been taken. Therefore, he wished an opponent to take from him on said contract up to the amount agreed for by Jeffries, which the opponent refused but one examination found that more rations of red stuff had been contracted for than was sufficient for the whole number of immigrants then in the rear. To wit, 12,000 pounds of flour, 12,000 rations, and 300 bushels of cornmeal, which would make 12,800 rations, making almost an entire surplus of the last named quantity, as only two days' rations could be hauled at a time, except an extreme scarce neighborhoods where supplies could not be procured at convenient distances, which was not the case in that section of the country. So see, there's more details that we don't know that they could only provide for two days at a time. The opponent then made another contract with Mr. Reddy, not only for the 7,000, but also for the portion of the 6,000 in his rear and a price is lower than those agreed to by Jeffries. Then it's suspended for, so the next day, once again, it's now Thursday, 4th of December, 1851. So he continues, when he continues, states that after closing the contract with Mr. Reddy, he proceeded on the route as far as Jefferson, a distance of 20 miles. Jefferson no longer exists, but it's southeast of Nashville. And at that place was met by a man who represented himself as the agent of Mrs. Martin, Stevenson and Company dry goods merchants residing in the city of Nashville. An agent claimed that said firm had a contract with Lewis Ross for subsisting the Cherokee immigrants from that place to a point 20 miles west of Nashville and at the time exhibited to the opponent a contract purporting to have been made by the assistance 
and his power into this fight. Skip the page there. To have made by Jeffries as agent for Ross was, was said firm of Martin Stevenson and Company for supplies for the immigrants for the distance above stated. The contract was, this contract was disregarded also for the same reasons. So, because the, but it said contract been made by an authorized agent, it could not have been complied with because the supplies thus contracted for both for the Indians and horses was the, for double the number than in the rear while traveling the same distance and at prices extravagantly high as the as for instance corn a new crop one dollar twelve and a half cents per bushel and two dollars and fifty cents or three dollars per hundred for fodder and with one mile of the said town of Jefferson defendant made a contract for corn and fodder sufficient to supply all the detachments in his rear say corn at 40 cents per bushel. Whereas the other price was a dollar twelve per bushel. And fodder at a dollar twenty-five per hundred, whereas the other was two dollars and fifty cents and three dollars. So and other supplies in proportion. Deponent after making all necessary arrangements at Jefferson for subsistence proceeded to Nashville, and at that place, the same contract was again presented by the one of the firm of Martin Stevenson and Company, probably Mr. Martin or Mr. Stevenson, but at Jefferson, the opponent refused to recognize the act of Jeffries as binding on Ross, and so treated this contract. But from the fact that said firm had purchased or enjoyed a great portion of the supplies, owner near the road, the opponent was compelled to make a contract with the same persons for supplies to be furnished at and near Nashville for all immigrants, then in the rear as they passed on. Yet the opponent effected a considerable reduction in the price of almost every article. The opponent purchased corn from said firm at 80 cents, thereby making savings to Ross of 32 and a half cents per bushel. But some 4,000 immigrants having previous to the arrival of opponent Jefferson had taken supplies on said contract. Consequently, the contractor Ross sustained a heavy loss on the supplies thus taken. And here the opponent deems it proper to, proper to state as his confident belief found upon the facts presented at the time that had Gordon or any other authorized agent used but ordinary efforts, he could have made contract with respectable farmers on and near the route for all supplies needed except sugar, coffee, soap, and salt. At prices much below those paid by the deponent, as such articles were sold by the farmers to said mercantile firm at prices, which enabled the said merchants to realize a handsome profit, even on the prices agreed at by deponent. But notwithstanding the disadvantage which deponent labored under, owing to the previous monopoly of the supplies, then the distance covered by this contract made by Jeffries with Martin Stevenson and Company, he opponent in the same distance, say from Jefferson to a point 20 miles west of Nashville, made his savings to Ross of over $5,000 for supplies to be taken by the immigrants, then in the rear. The opponent further states that while at Nashville, George Gordon came up and in a conversation with the opponent expressed himself as much dissatisfied with the opponent's course and having repudiated the contracts made by Jeffries, stating at the same time that Gordon had constituted said Jeffries an agent for Ross and thereby authorized him to make and sign said contracts. And also that Gordon had made Jeffries interested in said contract by dividing a portion of his, that is Gordon's interest with him, with the said Jeffries. 
The opponent denied Gordon's right to delegate any part of the authority vested in him as agent for Ross to Jeffries or anyone else. Some further conversation ensued when the opponent thought an amicable understanding was had between them and Gordon having previously informed the opponent that it was the wish of Ross that he, Gordon, should render the opponent all the assistance and his power and the discharge of the duties assigned him. The opponent being compelled to remain at Nashville a few days longer, winding up some unsettled business connected with the said contract, requested said Gordon to proceed as far as Hopkinsville in the state of Kentucky, being on the immigration route and to make all needful arrangements for supplies between Nashville and that place. It having been distinctly agreed upon and understood between said Gordon opponent at the time of the conversation and amicable understanding had as before stated that all contracts on the route purporting to have been made by Jeffrey should be disregarded and others made either by Gordon or the opponent in person. Therefore, in accordance with the opponent's request, said Gordon did set out in the direction of Hopkinsville and so the opponent then believed with the intention of making the arrangements for supplies as far as that place. And some two or three days thereafter, the opponent left Nashville, also and traveled in the same route, making inquiries he passed on in regard to the supplies needed by the immigrants, but found none made by said Gordon between Nashville and Hopkinsville. The opponent saw several contracts reporting to have been made by Jeffries. Consequently, the opponent found it indispensable to make arrangements of subsistence as he traveled on. At the Kentucky line, the opponent received a letter from Gordon purporting to have been written in Hopkinsville after his arrival at that place. Said letter, the, the opponent has lost or mislaid and cannot now find it. Neither does he know what has become of it. But in said letter, the opponent knows to have been in the proper handwriting for the said Gordon. The opponent was informed that no supplies could be had for the Indians then in the rear at or near Hopkinsville. Consequently, it would be necessary for the opponent to procure a sufficient to last them from a point 12 miles east to a point 12 miles west of Hopkinsville. This information caused the opponent to contract with the Mr. Gray living about 12 miles east of Hopkinsville for the quantity of supplies needed for the distance named in the letter that said Gordon. And by the way, Mr. Gray would have been the owner of Gray's Tavern, which is south of Hopkinsville. And that's where the well was, where uh, uh, White Path supposedly drank from the well there before going on to Hopkinsville where he and Flea Smith both died. So Mr. Gray is the owner of Gray's Inn. So this information was upon a contract with Mr. Gray, living about 12 miles east of Hopkins Hill for the quantity of supplies needed for the distance named in the letter of Gordon. The opponent then proceeded directly on the route as far as Hopkinsville with the expectation of finding Gordon there. But when the opponent reached there, he understood Gordon had left for the Ohio River, but before leaving said place had made a contract with one John Campbell, resident of Hopkinsville for four days rations of provisions for the immigrants then in the rear and the same number of rations of forage for their horses. This contract was presented to the opponent by Campbell immediately after the opponent's arrival at Hopkinsville, bearing the proper signature of Gordon in his own handwriting. Then they adjourned for the day once again. And the opponent continues that the prices agreed by Gordon's agent for Ross to be paid to Mr. Campbell were considerably higher than the opponent had contracted with Mr. Gray for similar articles. 12 miles east of Hopkinsville. Mr. Campbell insisted that the opponent would take the supplies contracted for by Gordon with him 
the deponing having at the instance of said Gordon made a contract 12 miles east for subsistence to sufficient to last the immigrants then in his rear to a place 12 miles west, found it impossible to comply with both contracts. To wit, the contract with Campbell and the contract made by the opponent with Mr. Gray. Consequently, the opponent disregarded Campbell's contract that having been made by said Gordon, when he had informed the opponent of the absolute necessity of making such contract 12 miles east of Hopkinsville, as he did make with Mr. Gray. Besides his objection to a compliance with Campbell's contract, it was made for more supplies than the immigrant wagons could possibly have hauled, exclusive of the supplies contracted for in Gray's. Opponent states further that a day or two after his arrival at Hopkinsville, said Gordon returned to that place and then stated to the opponent he had been as far as the Ohio River in order to renew the contract then existing with C. Scott and Company for subsistence from Hopkinsville to the Ohio River. Said contract having been made in the first instance by Jeffries, but that he had failed to meet with Mr. Scott, the acting partner of said firm, therefore had returned without making any arrangements whatever on that part of said route. The opponent inquired of Gordon why he had notified him that it would be necessary to make arrangements of, for supplies from a point 12 miles east to a 12 miles west of Hopkinsville because no supplies could be had at said town. And after writing the opponent to that effect, did contract with Mr. Campbell for more than was needed. And the opponent also inquired of Gordon why he failed to set aside the contracts made by Jeffries for supplies between Nashville and Hopkinsville and why he had not complied with his promise to the opponent when leaving Nashville in respect to said contract but also in making no arrangements in that part of said route for the immigration immigrants then in the rear. To those inquiries, no satisfactory answers were given, but result in an unpleasant altercation, which caused a separation between Gordon and Deponent. Gordon setting out for Nashville, as he stated, and Deponent in the direction of the Ohio River, where the immigrants were to cross over. But before said separation took place, after the opponent heard Gordon express his intention to leave for Nashville, the opponent inquired of Gordon and in his custody he had left the sugar, coffee, and soap at the Ohio and also at the Mississippi Rivers, and if any written order of authority from Gordon was necessary for the opponent to get it. To this inquiry, Gordon replied he had left a portion in care of Mr. Berry on the east bank of the Ohio River opposite Galconda, and the other portion he had deposited with Mr. Smith on the west bank of the Mississippi River at Willard's, formerly Green's Ferry, as directed by Lewis Ross at the time he placed in his hands the $5,000 to purchase the said articles. That no order or written authority from Gordon was necessary and he has instructed Mr. Barry and Smith to deliver said articles to the sub-agents of Lewis Ross accompanying each detachment as they passed. The opponent and Gordon separated immediately after this conversation. Gordon left Hopkinsville a few minutes before the opponent, and shortly after his departure, a contract was presented to the opponent purporting on his face to have been made by Jeffries with Charles Scott and Company for subsistence for immigrants commencing in Hopkinsville and terminating at the Ohio River, a distance of 75 miles. Said contract was repudiated by the opponent as all others therefore had been, which had been made by Jeffries. The person having said contract in possession permitted the opponent to retain it. And then he talks about presenting it in, in, in the Washington DC case. And then he attaches this as a, a copy of it as exhibit C to his deposition. The opponent states that he was not possibly certain who were all concerned in the firm known as C. Scott and Company, but did know that Charles Scott and one George S. Massey be two of the said firm. At the time of the existence of this contract, 
Charles Scott resided at a place called Randolph, some 200 miles below on the Mississippi River. And George Massey resided at Asheville, St. Clair County, Alabama, more than 300 miles from Hopkinsville. Several detach detachments having passed and taken supplies on said contract, the price is stipulated to be paid for supplies for that part of said route. The opponent ascertained by traveling the, the same and purchasing <clears throat> by traveling to the same in person was made much higher than contracted for by him and more than the customary prices for similar articles through the same country. Consequently, a loss was sustained by Lewis Ross to the amount of the difference for all supplies that had been taken before the opponent set aside the contract. The opponent states further that upon recurring to the foregoing part of this answer, he finds that he omitted to state that when in conversation with Gordon at Nashville on his return from the agency in Tennessee, that Gordon, when speaking of the purchase of the sugar, coffee, and soap, said it also when last at the agency, Lewis Ross had placed in his hands $1,000 to be expended in the said contract on the route of circumstances might require. As before stated, the opponent proceeded on the route from Hopkinsville to the Ohio River, make necessary arrangements as he passed on for all immigrants in the rear until he reached that point. And upon his arrival there late in the evening, made inquiry of Mr. Berry, resident and owner of said ferry, for the sugar, coffee, and soap deposited with them for the Cherokee immigrants by Gordon. When when to the opponent's great surprise, he ascertained that no such articles were there or had been left or purchased by Gordon, as stated by him to the opponent. At three different times and places previous, the opponent would not here state the answer of Mr. Berry when he was inquired of by the opponent for the sugar, coffee, and soap, were he now living. But as the opponent knows, said Berry's been dead many years, he deems it proper. So he wouldn't repeat what Berry had said about Gordon. The opponent, finding himself so often deceived by the statements of said Gordon and having discovered almost at every place where contracts have been made by said Jeffries, that the interest of the contractor Ross had suffered materially. The opponent determined to embrace an opportunity then presented as he believed to put said Ross in possession of all the facts touching the faithless course of Gordon and his man Jeffries. This opportunity as the opponent then believed was afforded by one John L. Colburn, who had also been in the service of Ross with the detachment of immigrants as far as Jackson, Missouri. And then on his return to Tennessee, the opponent found said Colburn at Mr. Berry's on his arrival there. And after ascertaining the failure of Gordon to purchase and deposit at that place, the sugar, coffee, and soap as he'd been directed to do so by Ross. The opponent mentioned to Mr. Colburn briefly the conduct of Gordon on the route up to the Ohio River and stated to him that he had some fears that a collusion had been formed between Gordon, Jeffries, Charles Scott, and George Massey to defraud said Ross and the opponent intend writing to said Ross by him in order that he might make his speedy steps as possible to put a stop to the fraudulent conduct then practicing by the above named persons on the said Ross's, to the said Ross's great injury. Colonel Colburn then remarked he had a letter then in his trunk from William Shorey Cootie, another of Lewis Ross's agents, then in, then in advance of the opponent. And William Shorey Cootie would have been a nephew of Lewis Ross. To the said Ross giving him the same information that he Colbert intended setting out the next morning for Nashville, where he hoped to meet with Lewis Ross as he had business to settle with him. But if he failed to meet with Ross at Nashville, he would travel the immigration route back until he did meet him and would certainly deliver 
opponent's letter, together with the letter by William S. Cootie. The opponent accordingly wrote to Ross that night and in said letter stated all the facts which had come to his knowledge of the contract of said Gordon and the reasons which would not be proper to state in this deposition. Why did opponent believe the collusion before named has been formed, had been formed? The opponent then folded, sealed, and addressed said letter to Lewis Ross at Nashville or elsewhere on the route traveled by the Cherokee immigrants and gave it to Colburn without entertaining any doubt whatever, but that it would be the, that he would, the moment he met with said Ross, deliver said letters. The opponent states further that the items of sugar, coffee, and salt being indispensable to the fulfillment of Ross's contract with the Cherokee Nation and none being at the point, it was then, at the point it was then needed, the opponent set out very early the next morning to Smithland at the mouth of the Cumberland River, some 25 miles below Berry's Ferry, for the purpose of purchasing a sufficiency of articles to last the immigrants to the crossing of the Mississippi River, a distance of about 60 miles. But when the opponent reached Smithland, neither sugar, coffee, or soap could be had. The opponent learned at said place that he could procure said articles at Eddyville, about 40 miles from Smithland, up the Cumberland River. Therefore, the opponent proceeded to Eddyville and found the said articles on board the steamer John Randolph, where he purchased 10 wagon loads, being more than was actually necessary to fill the contract from the Ohio to the Mississippi River. But the opponent purchased the additional quantity because he feared he would find none at the Mississippi River when he arrived there, which turned out to be the fact. The opponent states further that in order to have said, have said supplies at various ferry in time for the first detachment of immigrants, he was compelled to hire wagons and teams to travel night and day and had to pay them at the rate of $10 for each 24 hours while traveling said distance. So soon as said wagons were loaded, the opponent set out for the Ohio River and traveled until late that evening when he came into the road leading from Berry's Ferry to Nashville. And at the junction of said roads, the opponent met the aforesaid John Colburn. And when Colburn remarked in the hurry of starting from Colonel Berry's, he had neglected to, to pick up the letter given to him by the opponent for Lewis Ross and left it on the table in the room where he had slept. As before stated, the day was far spent, the weather extremely cold, and no house near. So the opponent had no opportunity to write another letter at the time, but relying on Colonel Colburn, the opponent requested him, as he was in possession of the principal part of the facts, to state them to said Ross as soon as he met with them, and to request him to proceed on westward without delay. This request said Coburn promised to comply with. The opponent, after parting with Coburn, began to reflect on the strange neglect in leaving the letter when he was apprised of its importance to Ross. Consequently, other fears came across the opponent's mind that more persons than those before named might have combined together carrying out the fraud against Ross. Therefore, the opponent determined to ride that night to Berry's Ferry, about 30 miles, where the opponent had left his son, Robert H. Heinemann, now dead, and to start him the next morning with said letter to said Lewis Ross. And some short time after midnight, the opponent reached Berry's Ferry, and to his great surprise, not only found on the table, as was stated by Colonel Colburn, the letter addressed by the opponent to Lewis Ross, but also another addressed to the person in the proper handwriting of the aforesaid William Shorey Cootie. And marked for Colonel Colburn, this was doubtless the letter spoken of to the opponent by Colburn as being in his trunk. This additional circumstance, this additional circumstances confirmed the previous suspicions of the opponent. And before retiring to rest, he wrote another letter to said Ross. Now, remember this 
He's had a really long day. He traveled 25 miles to Smithville, couldn't find the supplies. Then he went up the Cumberland, another 40 miles to Eddyville, and then crossed over and was coming back to Barry's Ferry. So uh, sure, he and his horse were both extremely tired. But he said, before retiring, I wrote another letter to Ross detailing the facts in relation to the said letters and enclosed the three letters undercover to said Lewis Ross. And the next morning early, started his said son with special directions to travel on the immigration route east until he met said Ross, even if he had to go as far back as the agency in Tennessee. The opponent states further, that on his first arrival at Barry's Ferry, being the evening he first met Colonel Coburn there, he also met with the aforesaid Jeffries and George S. Massey. And the opponent, after making the inquiry of Colonel Barry for the sugar, coffee, and soap, inquired for other supplies for said immigrants and expressed a desire to close the contract with said Barry for such as would be needed for the immigrants then in the rear. After said inquiry was made, and before Colonel Barry made any reply, said Jeffries remarked, we have a contract already with C. Scott and Company for all the supplies needed here. The opponent then inquired of Jeffries, who he alleged, alluded to when he said we. To this inquiry, he answered, that he, the said Jeffries, had made said contract with C. Scott and Company as agent for Lewis Ross, that he was authorized to do so by George Gordon, who had an interest in the contract with Ross, that he, Jeffries, was authorized, even without Gordon's permission or direction, from the fact that he was interested in the interest to be allowed to said Gordon by Lewis Ross on the final settlement of the Cherokee Nation. The opponent refused to recognize either the authority or the act of said Jeffries and closed a contract with Colonel Barry for such supplies as we needed at that point. The opponent in the conversation with Jeffries inquired if he, Jeffries, had not traveled on the same route in company with Charles Scott and George S. Massey, both of the firm of C. Scott and Company when they were purchasing supplies to fill the contract made by him with them. When said Jeffries admitted he had, and also that he had assisted them in making purchases and had written contracts made with the farmers owner near the route with the said C. Scott and Company at prices affording them a large profit on the sale to said Ross under the contract made by him as Ross's agent. So here he was, going and writing the contracts with the farmers to sell to this other company so that, that company could then sell at a much higher price to Ross. So the opponent feeling himself authorized by the instructions received from Ross and also a, a duty he owed said Ross as a faithful agent notified said Jeffries to consider himself from that time as not in the service of Ross and to meddle no further in his business. Whereupon the said Jeffries and George S. Massey ordered their horses and left immediately in the direction of Nashville, although then about sunset. This and the occurrence with John Coburn before related took place a few days before the date of a note during the genuine theater of Lewis Ross for the sum of $9,000 and payable to George Gordon in the final settlement of Ross's contract to with the 18th of December, 1838. And by the way, this entire lawsuit is about that $9,000 note that Gordon had sold to these other people that were suing Lewis Ross to pay it. So the opponent, in continuation of his answer to the Fifth interrogatory states that he remained at Barry's Ferry until the arrival of the sugar, coffee, and soap, and then crossed over to Golconda, Illinois, and traveled from thence to Jonesboro in the same state. 
about 45 miles from Golconda on the immigration route. In a few days, his son, Robert Heinemann, returned having with him the package of letters addressed to Lewis Ross by the opponent and started in care of the opponent's said son from Barry's Ferry as before stated. Said Robert Heinemann was but a boy of 13 years of age and on his way in search of Lewis Ross was made to believe as an opponent is well satisfied from the statements of his said son that Lewis Ross was nowhere nowhere on the route traveled by the Cherokee immigrants, but had taken passage from the agency east by water to the Cherokee country west. This information given to said Robert Heinemann, as he reported to the opponent at Hopkinsville and at Princeton on the said route, besides at other places, induced him to return after having traveled east from the Ohio River about 100 miles thereby preventing any communication being had between said Lewis Ross and the opponent. So, so they didn't have texting at those days to get word to him immediately. But in a very few days after the return of his opponent's son to Jonesboro, Lewis Ross also came. The opponent having in the meantime been as far as the ferry on the Mississippi River and having also crossed over to the West Bank for the purpose of inquiring for the sugar, coffee, and soap, as reported by George Gordon, to have been purchased by him for the use of the Cherokee immigrants and left in the care of Mr. Smith, the ferryman, for that purpose. But as the Ohio River opponent found no such articles there, neither did Mr. Smith, who is now dead, know any such man as George D. Gordon, as he stated to opponent at that time and frequently afterwards. The Mississippi River, about that time, say in almost all the month of December, 1838, was blocked with ice so as to prevent the crossing of the ferry boat only at short intervals, and continued in that condition until about the beginning of the month of February, 1839, thereby detaining a large portion of the said immigrants on the west bank, or excuse me, on the east bank of the said river until the river opened about the time above stated. The point states further that so soon as he found no sugar, coffee, or soap, as stated to him by Gordon, he proceeded to Cape Girardeau about 10 miles down the Mississippi River with the view of purchasing a supply, but could not get none. The opponent then returned to the ferry when the ice was running in such quantities as to prevent the boat crossing without imminent danger. But the opponent's duties being urgent, he prevailed on the ferryman to take the opponent over in a skiff. And in that craft, the opponent succeeded in crossing, leaving his horse on the west bank. The opponent then procured another horse and rode to Cairo at the mouth of the Ohio River, about 60 miles, and there found a large number of steamboats stopped by the ice. And from one, one of them, the opponent procured the supply of sugar, coffee, and soap, but could obtain no land transportation at that place, and then could be had by water owing to the great quantity of ice then in the river. Consequently, the opponent returned to the neighborhood of Jonesboro and procured wagons and teams and had such articles transported to the ferry above by land. On the opponent's return to Jonesboro from Cairo, he for the first time met with Lewis Ross when he immediately communicated all the facts which had come to his knowledge of the fraudulent conduct of Gordon and his man Jeffries, together with the evidence the opponent had become possessed of that satisfied him of a collusion having been concocted between Gordon, Jeffrey, Stott, and Massey to make large profits out of the said contract to the great injury of said Lewis Ross. The time being about the 25th of December, 1838. Very shortly after the above communication to, to, said, to said Ross, he together with the opponent proceeded to Jackson, 12 miles from the west bank of said Mississippi River, 
in the state of Missouri. And immediately after our arrival at said town, the said Ross had an advertisement or notice prepared, which he had published for the, in the first number of a newspaper printed at said place after his arrival there, cautioning all persons from trading for a note bearing the date of the 18th of December, 1838, for the sum of $9,000 executed by said Lewis Ross and made payable to George D. Gordon on final settlement of the contract with the Cherokee Nation at the, <clears throat> at the same had been fraudulently obtained. He sent copies by mail from Jackson, of course said to Louisville, Kentucky, Cincinnati, Ohio, and also to Nashville, Tennessee, directing publication to be made in the newspapers printed in each of said places a correct copy of the advertisement is here into annex and made part of the deposition mark exhibit E. So the, the printed copy having been taken from the newspaper printed at Jackson at the time of course it filed and made a part of the opponent's deposition. And so Again, early in the month of February, 1839, the said Lewis Ross, fearing his letters to the different printing establishments, the places above might have miscarried. He advertised said note a second time on the newspaper printed at Jackson aforesaid, and also wrote several letters to other printing offices, requesting them to insert said advertisements in their paper. The opponent having heretofore omitted it, he now states as part of his answer to this interrogatory that immediately after crossing the Ohio River, he was met at Golconda with another contract according on its face to have been made by Jeffries, his agent for Ross, contractor subsisting said Cherokee immigrants with the aforesaid C. Scott and Company for supplies from, Gal from Golconda to Willard's formerly Green's Ferry on the Mississippi at a distance of 60 miles. A true and correct copy of the said contract is also part of his exhibit E. Now it goes on and on because then he gets into Missouri and farther on and he finds contracts made by Jeffrey under the name of a new another company that they can't identify and then they also find them signed by someone contracts signed by someone named McCoy that they can't identify either who that was. So, but of course they didn't recognize any of those. And eventually, of course, this went to the Supreme Court of Tennessee. And eventually it was decided in Ross's favor that the note had been fraudulently obtained and was therefore no good. And the persons who had purchased the note from Gordon could not collect on it. But it does give a lot of details on providing the supplies and how, how it was handled that we did not know about. So, so that's some of the stuff that Mike has uncovered for us. And this was in the Supreme Court cases that we've never looked at before. So any comments? Okay. Well, maybe just chat, a more of a general thing is you don't ever quit researching because you think you've seen everything and you think everything's been found and it had. And that's probably a lot, a lot more than you wanted to know, but nevertheless, I found it interesting because of all these details yeah. and the problems that were had in contracting for the goods. Uh, a side comment that George Massey from Alabama was one of the valuing agents of mm -hmm. Cherokee improvements. So people who complained about the value, character of character. Yeah. 
So they're all okay. in Yes. It, it appears that the handling of all this supplies and so forth was so full of fraud, it was unbelievable. Yes. About like today. <laughs> I know. It is. <laughs> Doc, I've always heard that um, Lewis Ross was not honest and forthright. How does this affect your view of Ross? Well, I don't have any reason to think that he wasn't honest and forthright. Now, I'm sure that he may still came out ahead on his contract. So and did make money off of it. But then he also did the work too, and all these headaches. It seems like there's more blame to place elsewhere than on Lewis. Right. And other people made lots of money. For example, Barry, at Barry's Ferry, he made enough. Well, he ran the ferry and virtually all of them crossed there at Barry's Ferry. And uh, all that went on the northern route except for the bench detachment. So he made a good bit of money in crossing at the ferry. And then he also made money on providing provisions. Supposedly that uh, he made enough that he built a large two-story brick house immediately after the removal. So there are a lot of people that made money off our forced removal. Nothing's also, changed. No, but you also notice that a lot of those people, individuals involved, were from Nashville, the home of Jackson. But there's still lots of good stuff out there to be found. Okay. Well, if we have no other business, I will declare us officially adjourned.